Good morning, church. Christ is risen. Amen and amen. I want to welcome you to church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Who else is excited about seeing everything turn green and warm and flowers blooming? Praise the Lord for that. I want to welcome you to worship here at Faith Community Church, whether you're joining us in person or online today. We are grateful for you, and we are excited to be the body of Christ worshiping together today. A few announcements I want to share with you this morning before we get started. Uh, you probably saw the table that's right outside the door when you came in. It has on there information about our script, script fundraiser. This is gift cards you can order. The church makes a little bit of money off of it. It's a really great program. I encourage you to check it out. Orders are due today. If you have any questions, talk to Gail Holmes, who's walking in right now, and she'll be happy to help you figure that out. <laughs> She's happy to do it, see? Uh, we also have our next blood drive coming up a week from Tuesday, uh, April 23rd from 1 to 6.30. We'd really encourage you to get involved with that. Giving blood, if you can, is a great way to share our resources, right, our blood resources, but also to save lives in the process. Also want to um, share with you two different things that we're going to be doing today. Well, two different things we're going to be talking about. The first is a start of a social media campaign. Okay. Since we launched our new name, what we want to do because of that is get our name out there so we can increase our witness online. So there's a few things that you can do that are really easy to help with that. The first one is if you're on YouTube, find, uh, search Faith Community Church of Coopersville and subscribe to our channel there. The more likes we get or the more subscriptions we get on there, the more our videos go out. Um, it will really help with that. Also, like us on Facebook and Instagram. Again, this gets us uh, bumped up in the algorithms on those social media. More people are going to see it. The more you engage with what we put on those sites, again, the more people that are going to see it, and it increases our witness. And then here's another one that we haven't pushed before. But I'd encourage you to go on Google and write a review of the church. It is proven, there's so much data out there that most people, when they're looking for a church, will Google it. They will go and look you up online, and they will look at the reviews of the church. So go on there, Faith Community Church of Coopersville, very easy to find, and just write a review. This will, again, help to get more people seeing what's going on here, what God is doing, interested in it, and maybe bring them into our congregation. So help us out with that. The other thing I want to share is uh, our texting number. As a church, we have a number that you can text to share prayer requests. If you're going into the hospital and you forget to tell Pastor Corey before you go into the hospital, here's a great number to text so that Pastor Corey knows you're in the hospital and doesn't find out afterwards. Yes, you know who you are. Uh, it's also a great way to receive updates from the church if we have weather cancellations or other things that are going on. So text the word hello to that number, 844-453-7363. That will opt you into our texting program and, and get you connected with that. Uh, like I said, too, it's a really great way of sharing prayer requests with the church as well. With that, um, I would invite you to join me in prayer this morning as we begin our time of worshiping God. Gracious and holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you all praise and glory on this wonderful day. We are gathered here as your people in this place to worship your name, to encounter your presence once again as a community, to be encouraged and challenged and equipped to partner with you in spreading the gospel in this world. So Lord, through all that we do and say this day, may you be glorified. May your name be proclaimed, and may your people be are equipped to share the love of Jesus with those we encounter in our lives. We give you all praise and glory this day, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Stan Burtog, for those that don't know me. And it is a pleasure to be here today. Amen. Amen. We will be reading Philippians 1, verse 27, through Philippians 2, verse 18. I invite you to open your Bibles, follow along, follow along on the screen. I am reading from the New Living Translation. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. Then, whether I come to see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together, you have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He, looked, he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful servant is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, 
Who's full of joy today? That was a really quiet joy. Wow. Pretty sure they could not hear that on the online service. Okay, let's try this again. Who's full of joy today? There you go. There you go. We are the joyful people of God. Amen? Amen and amen. Praise Jesus. There you go. <laughs> okay, so if I turned out all the lights in this room, what would happen? Right now, nothing, right? <laughs> because it's not dark out. But what about in 12 hours from now? If I turned out the lights, it'd be a little light. How likely do you think it would be that you could make it, make your way from here out to the front doors without running into anything? Some of you might do what I would do in that situation, which would I have done in many situations. Yes, turn them on, folks. Flashlight, right? You know, uh, when we were kids, not you young kids, but the rest of us, when we were kids, you know, our teachers always told us that we have to learn math because we'd never have a calculator. Right. We'd carry a calculator around with us, right? We have a calculator. We have a flashlight. Man, we have all sorts of stuff. But anyways, yeah, so we would probably turn on our handy-dandy flashlight. Now, why would we turn on our flashlight? So we could see, right? Because... That was kind of scary. We're just going to cut that part out of the online service. <laughs> the reality is having a light in the darkness makes it a whole lot easier to see, right? And to navigate safely. Now, most of us are used to this church. We're used to the layout of things, where the tables and the counters are in the fellowship hall, where the chairs are in here. You know, we know where the inside doors are, the outside doors are. So we could probably fumble our way through pretty easily in the dark. Well, unless the pastor rearranges things, which reminds me, it's been a while since I've done that. Thank you. Everybody thank Chrissy. Okay, but what about someone who's never been in the building before? Someone who doesn't know where all the things are. How likely do you think it would be for them to maybe stub a toe or get a banged knee trying to make it through the church without lights on? See, it's even more important for those who don't know the way to have a light to help them. This morning, as Dave did just a minute ago, we can give thanks to God that we know Jesus Christ. Amen? The light of the world who shines into the darkness of this world, who points out for us the dangers and shows us the way to salvation. But we have this light and come on, let's admit it, sometimes we still struggle with the darkness, don't we? Our world is a hard place, a dangerous one with many traps, just waiting to do a whole lot more than just bang up our knees. Sin is so pervasive, evil is everywhere. So much so that without Jesus, we know we'd be lost. Amen? So what about those who don't have Jesus? What about those who are walking around lost in the darkness? If you brought a new friend to the church this evening, or to some other place that you're really familiar for, with, but they weren't, what's the first thing you're probably going to do? You're going to turn the light on for them, right? So that they can see. Okay, these are really elementary metaphors here. Hopefully you see where I'm going with this, right? Folks, our world is full of people walking around, banging their knees, getting beaten down by sin and evil who have no way of seeing the way through. What do they need? They need light. They need Jesus, and they need us. This is why Paul, the Apostle Paul, in, this writing of, or in writing this letter to the Philippian Christians that we're working through this month in our Joyful series, this is why he says in chapter 2, verse 15, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, 
shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. We are to be shining lights in a dark world, pointing people to the even brighter light, Jesus. That's what Jesus was talking about in his most famous sermon. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. We read about it in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And in verses 14 through 16 of chapter 5, Jesus said this. He said, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand to give, and where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, Jesus said, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You are the light of the world, shining so that people can see God. Now let's be honest, sometimes our lights are shining a bit dimly. Unfortunately for some, maybe our lights have gone out. But folks, as the church, as the redeemed people of God, as sons and daughters of the Most High King, we are supposed to shine our light brightly in this world so that others may see Christ and shine as well. Now, would you agree that our world right now is in a really bad state, right? I mean, there's darkness all around us. Sure, there are moments when the light shines, when we see the goodness of God. I sat at my desk this morning and watched the sunrise come up over the horizon, and it was beautiful. But we know that those moments are usually bookended by some pretty dark ones, aren't they? Not sure if you noticed or not, but our economy is still tanking. Grocery prices are still going up. People are hungry homeless, hurting, and sick. Our prisons are in shambles. Drugs are flooding our streets from all corners of our country. Women, men, and children are being used and abused every single day. Yes, Ukraine is still fighting with Russia, and Israel is still fighting with Palestine. And now they've decided to attack Iran, right? Why not? Who then decided to attack back which brought the involvement of some more major world powers. Yeah, darkness is all around us. And the painful reality of that darkness is that many, many of the people that we love and care about, they just don't know that there is a light, that there is hope that the darkness will not win. They go through their lives just trying to survive. You know these people, right? They're, they're just going about every day, just taking care of their own, trying to make the payments and give the kids a better life than they had and, and keep their heads above water all while they feel like they're one wave away from drowning. And this isn't anything new. I mean, this is, this is human existence on this earth. This is the way it was when your parents were kids. It's like it was 500 years ago. And this is like it was when Paul wrote this letter to this small group of Christians trying to figure out how to shine their lights in the darkness of the Roman world. And in the midst of all of that, as we saw last week when we started looking at this letter, Paul wanted to encourage them. He wanted them to be full of joy. He wanted their love to overflow more and more, to continue growing in their knowledge and understanding of God and, and always be filled with the fruit of their salvation, which brings glory and praise to God. See, Paul wanted them to be full of joy. Paul wants you to be full of joy. Paul does not want to hear, who's full of joy this morning? Yeah. And why is Paul so concerned that we live joyful lives? 
because Paul knows that God will use our joy no matter our situation, no matter if we're suffering or if we're having the best day ever. God will use that joy to spread the good news, to spread the message about salvation through Jesus Christ. When you and I are filled with joy, when we shine the light of Jesus through our lives, people hear the good news. People find that there is light that will light their path in the darkness because we're going to point them to it. I mean, that's what our job is as Christ followers, is to point other people to the light, not just set their hope on that they're going to find it on their own. Your job is to shine the light of Jesus, not hide it under a bushel, not let Satan blow it out. We are to shine our light till Jesus comes so that others may know him like we do. And that's why Paul writes what he does in our reading today. He wants Christ followers to live lives that shine the light of Jesus. Now, Paul loves to use metaphors and analogies, okay, to help folks understand the things of God, because the truth is the things of God are so beyond our understanding, right? So he uses a metaphor like shining lights, right? We know that we're not actually shining, beaming. It'd be kind of scary if we were, right? But he's talking about the light of Christ shining through us, through our actions, through our love, through the ways we interact with others. Another metaphor that, um, that Paul uses here today in our reading is that of citizenship. He talks about living as citizens of heaven and not citizens of this world. Picking up in verse 27 of chapter 1 of Philippians, Paul says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, he says, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Paul says we should be united in our faith. Of one mind, one spirit, we should be of one accord in agreement on the things of faith. See, so Paul is making a play here on the, the dual citizenship that the Philippian church has. Being citizens of, or residents of Philippi, they are citizens of the Roman government. And being followers of Christ, they are citizens of the kingdom of God. See, Philippi was a city known for its Roman patriotism. But they needed to understand where their true citizenship was. So Paul says, you need to live in your country as worthy citizens of the kingdom of God. See, Paul says, I know even though you're a citizen of Rome, that's great and all, but you cannot look to Caesar for salvation. You cannot look to anyone but Jesus, who is our Lord alone. No other human, no matter how powerful, how politically savvy they are, no other human will ever be able to save us and should not be heralded as such. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but it's an election year. So much excitement, right? We're facing another round of a contentious presidential election. Valuable seats will be up for grabs in federal and state governments. Even our own country is facing some important elections this year. Or our own county, I'm sorry, is facing some important elections this year that will have a direct impact on our lives. And in our political and current cultural climate, it is tempting to put our hope behind a particular candidate, thinking that they will fix everything that's wrong with our country and reverse everything that the last person screwed up. But just like the Philippians had to be reminded that Caesar was not God, nor would he save anyone, 
Neither will any particular candidate that you support. As believers, we are to live not with all of our, our hope in our government, but we are to live as loyal citizens in the kingdom of heaven with all of our hope in Jesus. See, we're to live lives that reflect the values and the truth of the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of the United States. Now, unfortunately, we are really good at confusing patriotism, which is being thankful for, for the good of our country of origin, with nationalism, which is loving our country at the expense of all other countries. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Four Loves, he made the point very clearly. He said, love of country becomes a demon when it becomes a god. Let me say that again. Love of country becomes a demon when it becomes a god. See, basically, we humans have this tendency to too easily allow our celebration of our nation to intertwine with and pervert our love of God. We think that if God is for us, that means God is for our country. If God is for our country, that means that our country is above all other countries. That means that our country can do no wrong. And that is not acting as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Now, is it wrong to love your country? No, absolutely not. We, we can celebrate the nation that we come from, the good things that it provides. But it becomes wrong when we confuse country with God, when we elevate our nation to the level of divine, when we put our hopes of salvation in the hands of politicians and governments. So we can love our country just fine. But when it leads to putting God and his ways and precepts on the back burner, then we have a problem. It's like this. We have to declare our allegiance to God's kingdom above all else. And that means we follow God in his ways, even when that is at odds with our country and its laws. This means that our view of war has to be seen through God's eyes. The ways we look at Immigration, religion and ethnicity, hunger and poverty, marriage and family, the beginning of life, the ending of life, and everything in between, all of it has to be viewed through God and not through public policy or political ideology. So basically, folks, it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat or something else. It doesn't matter which candidate you think should, would serve our country's interests the best or serve your interests the best. What matters is how we live as God's people, as citizens of his kingdom, even with our dual citizenship here. See, Paul calls us to live into the reality that our home is not in this world. He wants believers to be proud and faithful citizens of the kingdom of God above all else. And in order to do that, we need to stand firm together in one spirit and one mind so that we will be striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. See, we need to present a witness to this world that shows us not divided, but united. Now, this does not mean that we all have to be of the same opinion. There are things that, that we can disagree on and still live together with. Amen? But there are things that are vital that we agree on. There is one God. God, through Jesus Christ, offers us salvation. God, through the Holy Spirit, gives us the power to live as citizens of his kingdom and to shine the light of Jesus in this world. Those are things we can agree on and we should agree on. 
Unfortunately, too often, instead of working side by side, churches and Christians are more likely to come side by side in order to argue their theological perspectives or to complain about their preferences not being met rather than fighting together for the gospel. Folks, the church needs to stop fighting itself. And we need to start fighting together for the sake of the gospel in this world. You know what Satan loves more than anything? For churches to split. For Christians to be divided because of things that don't matter. Before I get off track and go off on a whole other sermon on that, we're going to get back to Paul here. See, Paul knows this is not an easy thing to do. In fact, contending for the gospel, especially in unity with other Christ followers, often brings us hardships and suffering. It often means that people are going to attack us, that the systems of our world are going to hate us, that we're going to have to face oppression and persecution and suffering and condemnation because we follow Christ. But that's okay. Paul tells us, see, in this, in this crazy way, Paul tells us that we have been, been given the privilege of suffering with Christ, even when we're screaming our heart out because things aren't fair. Like now. <laughs> For those that are joining us online, don't worry. It's the kids in the nursery, and they're not being abused as much as they might tell you they are. We have been given the privilege of suffering along with Christ. Because suffering with Christ means that we are partnering with Christ. We are sharing in his great work of salvation. Now, who here thinks it's a privilege to suffer? Who here is excited about pain and misery and abuse? <laughs> But who here knows that we can still have joy in the midst of our suffering because we are partnering with Christ, because Christ didn't go through anything that we haven't gone through. And because we know that even in the midst of the worst suffering imaginable, God still won. God still conquered death. God raised Jesus from the dead. God is still working in this world, working every single thing for your good, even the bad things, he's working them for your good. And in that, in that, my friends, there is great joy. See, Paul tells us that we are to be imitators of Jesus. We are to live our lives just like him. Now, if you want to know what that looks like, you're going to have to read the Gospels. And don't stick with just watching a television show while that's awesome. You actually have to know Jesus in order to learn to live like him. And Paul tells us here, he, he, he lays out something in the middle of, of chapter 2 here that is just brilliant and wonderful, and it actually is, is one of the first hymns ever written about Christ. Okay, They call it the Christ hymn, in fact. And it starts in chapter 2, verse 6, and it goes through verse 11. And Paul says here, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, and he was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above other na all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen and amen. This is what it looks like to imitate Christ. To be humble. To be willing to suffer. 
to be willing to put our ways aside for God way, God's ways, to be willing to put our interests on hold so that we can work towards the interests of others. Being humble means that we're not going to brag about who we are and what we can do because Jesus, remember, was God and he came and he literally washed feet. Now, I don't know about you or me, but if I was writing a story about me being God, I certainly wouldn't be washing feet. But see, Jesus didn't care about what other people thought of him. He didn't care about the humiliation that he would have to endure. All he cared about was the love that God had for us. And that motivated him to great acts and small acts, to acts of faith and acts of healing and sharing hope and offering life to the least and the lost and even to us. See, as citizens of the kingdom of God, my friends, we are to live on this earth in such a way that we're blameless and innocent, that people can look at us and see us as children of God without blemish, that our, so that our light will shine in the midst of this crooked and perverse world so that others may see Jesus. Now think about it for you. Somebody shined that light into your life, didn't they? Maybe it was a group of somebodies, but there was some Christ follower who took Jesus at his word and lived humbly and in such a way that they shined their light to light up the darkness of your life. See, as representatives of Jesus, we are to partner with him. Come here, baby. You can't cry, okay? There you go, Lido. As representatives of Jesus, we partner with him in his work and his suffering. We live holy lives, set apart lives, lives that shine the light of Jesus to this lost and hurting world. See, our, see folks, our light, our little light, we need to let it shine. We need to let it shine till Jesus comes. We need to let it shine so others can see. Let it shine so no matter what happens. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amen. Pray with me. Almighty God, you give us the joy of celebrating the Lord's resurrection. Give us also the joys of life in your service and bring us at last to the full joy of life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious and holy God, we thank you so much for the life that you give us, for the light that has been shined into our lives. And we thank you, Lord, that we can, through your spirit, shine into the darkness of others' lives. Lord, help us to shine brightly. Help us to be bold and courageous, Lord. Help us to speak up no matter what so that others can hear. So that others can hear the good news of Jesus. Yeah, look at those lights. That's rainbow. They're rainbow lights. They're pretty, right? Yeah. Lord, help us to shine just like these lights. Beautiful and eye-catching so that people notice, Lord, so that people see you. Gracious God, help your church to be united in faith, united in one mind in our service of Christ, so that all may see and give glory to God. Lord, we pray for those among us today who are suffering. We know, Lord, that you say that it is a privilege to suffer in you, but that doesn't make it any easier. And so, Lord, we pray for your peace, 
and your strength. We pray for your healing. And we pray, Lord, that through each of our suffering, whatever it is, Lord, that you would use it to shine the light of Jesus. Lord God, we praise you. We give you all thanks today. And we join our voices together as we pray the way Jesus taught us to through the Lord's Prayer as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So oh.